Okay, so um, yeah, thanks very much for having me. It's really great privilege to be here and present to everyone who's interested in kind of doing eco stats or you know statistics and ecology. Um, it's a I guess a broad spectrum of of approaches, models, and disciplines. But um, I guess we're going to give a bit of a, a flavour of um, using eco mix and finite mixture models. So um, I've been kind of leading the development of the Ecomix package, which we'll run through the code later. But really, this is a body of work that's beyond mine. So it's really led by, um, from the offset, people like Piers Dunstan, who's a CSIRO, um, Scott Foster, also a CSIRO, and Nicole Hill, who's at University of Tasmania. And there's a bunch of other people as well who have had a you know um, big influence on the development of Ecomix and finite mixture models in this kind of the context that we're, we're, we're talking, I'll be talking today, um, but I'll kind of won't mention them all, but you kind of, they'll crop up throughout the talk. Um, so you'll see that. So, um, so kind of, um, you know, ecology is difficult. So this is kind of why I want to start with, like why we want to use these models. Okay. And so, you know, it's complex, biology is complex, there's complex geography, um, complex pressures, complex relationships between these pressures and, and species, interactions. It's just like, you know, it's complex. So if you look at, this is an example of a, an ecosystem model, um, Atlantis, which comes, which is developed at Saro in Tassie by Beth Fulton. Um, and you can see that, you know, lots of things go into understanding, you know, um, understanding what we see in terms of the biology we see in space. So there's oceanographical, sorry about that. Oceanographic kind of drivers, there's the fishery side, economic, there's all sorts of things. Okay. So to be able to, um, we need to somehow communicate the biology in a way, which is, um, which is a message, which must be simple, but clear. Okay. Okay. So, um, so we have to provide, the reason why we have to provide this clear message is because we need to actually, um, is they just communicate these complex systems in a way that is, I guess, understandable by managers, by scientists, by um, you know people who are interested in scientists who are interested in ecology. And I guess if we can't do this in a way which is kind of, I guess, robust and clear, it kind of has potentially can have de detrimental effects on the environment because we're not actually communicating the needs of these ecosystems that we're trying to represent. Okay, but the kind of the trick is we kind of have to have this kind of message that's real. Okay, so it's got to be based on real data and it's got to be in a way that is kind of prediction ready. So um, kind of what do we, what predicting what, we'll kind of get to that in a sec. But it also, you know, hopefully we'll have some statistical interpretation. So we'll be able to have some um, description of uncertainty in, in this message that we're going to um, purvey. Okay, and so I guess the question is, what is a simple message? And we kind of, in the development of the Ecomix package and the models that are in it, we kind of want to kind of borrow off this kind of human nature, the human machine, which is this kind of, we have this great ability to classify and categorize things, okay? And so we do this all the time in terms of colors, you know, species taxonomy, countries, okay? So it's a way to take complex information that is often, you know, a spectrum and um, presented in a way which is, I guess, um, distilling down, I guess, the core information that we want to understand. Okay. Um, and obviously, because we're coming at it from CSIRO has a very management focused, um, we kind of want to be able to have these kind of, yeah, this message, which is easy to interpret. Okay. Um, so I guess the simplification of this message has some great characteristics as is, you know, we can simplify and communicate to people, but doesn't necessarily produce the best model. Okay. So we're going to say from the outset because it is a simplification of the system. So, um, but what it does do is that once we've produced the model and the outputs we're going to produce, which I'll get to in a sec, <laughs> um, it does actually, we don't require any further analysis because it's kind of this model based statistical outputs. Okay. So we can, we can see the model based methods. Okay. Only. Okay, and so what are model-based methods? Well, they're kind of like GLM, generalized linear model kind of approaches. Okay, so we're not, we're doing multivariate kind of statistics here, but we're not kind of doing descriptions of the data or derivatives of the data, like something like dissimilarities. Okay, and so what does this do? It kind of makes us formally 
um, think about the research question. So what do we want to ask? Do we want to ask in terms of when we've got our multi-species data sets, what do we want to ask? What question do we want to ask? And how are we going to answer that? It, the benefit of being model-based is very producible and also has lots of nice characteristics from model checking and diagnostics, which is a great feature of model-based approaches. So things like residuals and you know, model selection. Okay. And so in kind of thinking about multiple species community, um, we're doing about ecosystems, there's often the research questions are broad and we want to often understand about um, things like that are often unobserved properties within the data. So things like assemblages, ecoregions, so functional groups, species groups, communities, stocks. Okay, so none of these things are observed. So they're kind of, their characteristics, their classifications of multiple species data. So we're trying to build models that are tailored to understanding these latent uh, groupings. Um, latent is another term for like unobserved or hidden. Okay, and so um, our solution is to poise statistical models which sit within the Ecomix package to help us formally do this. Okay, and so there's kind of two main thrusts that we want to get to when we're using Ecomix, and it's we want to ask questions about species. So um, or we want to ask questions about sites, locations. And what I mean by that is, say we have a, uh, you know, a, we've gone out, we've sampled sites, we've counted the species of those sites. We want to understand about information about how the species respond, or do we understand about how the sites respond? Okay. And so these kind of models assume that there's like a finite number of latent levels. Okay. Um, and this is kind of also plays into that kind of, uh, simplicity thing because by being finite which means that there's like a set number of groups or mixtures that we estimate okay and this leads to finite mixture models of one kind or another which is okay all right and so the data that we have um yeah so like i said a second ago the data we have is often ecological survey data and it's often as rich in information for observation so we might have information on the abundance of multiple species at sites or the presence or absence of them, um, maybe the biomass, okay? And then um, often we don't have that information. We don't, often we don't have a huge amount of information, huge numbers of sites, but we often have wide matrices of species, okay? All right. And then of course, typically we have information on covariates at those sites. So for instance, this is kind of, this talk is kind of built around marine examples. So there might be, you know, position of the sample, like it's, it's spatial position, the depth, the temperature. Um, and we can use this information to help us understand those, you know, the species question or the sites question. Okay. And so it leads to this, these two models that sit with an eco mix. Okay. Um, so we have these multivariate responses, which are kind of conditionally independent. And then the first kind of approach, which I'll talk about is species archetype models or um, they're also called mixtures of aggressions. Okay. And basically what they want to, well, if we want to ask questions about how do species group according to their responses to the environmental gradients. So you could think of these as species groups or assemblages of species, which have like a joint preference to the environment. Okay. And then there's um, mixtures of experts or also called regions of common profile. That's what we call them. Um, and these are kind of clustering on sites. So, so we're thinking about how do uh, homogeneous groups of sites, so sites that have similar species composition, group with the environment. So, so the easiest kind of, the kind of closest analogies like ecoregions or bioregions, we're thinking about that, okay? Okay, and so um, species archetype models, I'll just quickly go into those. So we, we kind of grouping species according to their response to the environment. We kind of have these soft clusters and so not hard clusters, so it's probabilistic. Okay, and essentially what we do is perform a regression on each species. And then if we're thinking about this intuitively, like we would do this from like a species by species perspective. Okay, we're saying, well, we're gonna perform a regression, fit like a GLM to each species. And then we're gonna cluster on the regression coefficients. And then we'll then use those clustered regression coefficients to then make a prediction into space or into environment. Okay, okay but the mixture modeling approach allows us to do this, this kind of two-step approach where we will say fitting a model and then clustering it allows us to do this in this one step. Okay, and so then we can get this kind of a, an archetype which represents this group of species um, as described by like a GLM or a regression. Okay, so um, just a 
quick equation. And there's a few of these, but they're not, they're pretty easy to follow. So, um, so we basically, this is our very simple cut down version of a species archetype model. Um, so the indexes essentially I, J, and K are I for sites or sampling sites, J is species and K is archetypes. Okay, and essentially the model is, is kind of an extension of a GLM, whereas we basically have um, the species, for each species, we can predict it conditional on this latent variable, which is the archetype, essentially, um, the true archetype. Okay, and then essentially we have this the intercepts, alpha j, and this function, uh, gk, which is essentially fits this design matrix. Um, XI, which is essentially, this is kind of describes the archetype. So this can be any kind of functional form applicable to a glim. Okay, so it could be it's like some linear terms, could be quadratics, could be splines that are not penalized. So it can't do gammy things, but it can do glimmy things. Okay, and then depending on the underlying distribution. So if you're using, say, if your data is a binomial, then you would have an appropriate link function that relates that binomial data to the the linear predictor. Okay, so this would be a logit link function in that example. In that case, okay, so that's kind of the the, the basis of a, the basics of a species archetype model. And to kind of show that in kind of reality, so this is an example just across a um, one dimensional gradient. So let's say it's temperature. Okay, and you know this is simulated data, so it looks better than what happens in reality. But um, so keep that in mind. But um, so basically we have this kind of gradient and we have these species color lines of the responses of the individual species across this gradient. Okay. And then um, essentially if that was our, say our real data, our observed data, when we fit a species archetype model, we kind of get these latent groups essentially. So we have this one archetype that likes it, say it's cold. We have one that likes it a little bit warmer and then one likes it a little bit hotter. Okay, and so we're kind of distilling down all these species into these kind of this one kind of um, regression line, if that makes sense. Okay, all right, and then we can we can kind of do um, once we have those kind of GLMs per archetype, we can do lots of kind of GLM -y things. So we can do predictions. Um, I'm not going to go into all the like residuals and model fitting and stuff. I'll go through that in the R code, but I'll just give you a flavor of what you can kind of get out of these things. Okay. So this is an example. Um, this is the East Coast of Australia. Um, Sydney's kind of up here somewhere. Melbourne's down here somewhere. And essentially these are just fish assemblages that have been fitted to a bunch of environmental covariates and then predicted. Uh, and so essentially you kind of got some shallow ones, some shelfy ones, and there's some deep ones kind of here. So it's not great description of the data, but yeah, I don't have much time to go through it all in detail. Okay. So, um, so that's kind of species archetype models and we'll kind of go through the code and hopefully it'll be become a bit clearer what they're kind of doing um, in a sec. Okay. But then we've got regions of common profile models. So this is kind of the other side of the kind of multi-species data set, um, matrix. So essentially we're kind of grouping sites according to their species profile. Okay. And, go, and what do we mean by a profile? Well, a species profiles are kind of based on at each site, the expectations um, or the means or the prevalence of those species. So it's kind of like, we're, so basically kind of clustering sites based on the species we see in them. Okay, okay. Okay, and so then the probability of observing that profile. So that kind of, that um, description of the species is then, is then can be mapped, okay. So kind of intuitively, like the, the species archetype model approach, this is kind of like performing a clustering on sites and then regressing those clusters to the environment. But it's not quite because it's a bit more complicated than that. But it's kind of the simplest way to think of it. Okay. And so this kind of, once again, mixture model allows us to do this as one step. And then we can obviously do nice, lots of nice things like propagate uncertainty through the model do model selection and um, yeah, lots of interest, good features of doing using this as a model-based statistical approach. So hopefully this will make, it's a bit blurry, but hopefully this will make it a bit clearer. So say for instance, we have these species, um, you know, that are found in these different say bioregions. So one, two, three, and four, um, the species can persist across all bioregions, but they kind of, they can persist in different 
prevalences or abundances. And it's that combination of the abundances um, within that region that makes it the RCP, okay? So for instance, fragments in this one, like the hammerhead shark is highly abundant, um, but the kind of the, the snappery thing is low abundance. Where over here, the snapper is high abundance, but the hammerhead shark's low abundance. So you kind of this combination of those abundances makes the region, right? Okay, and so this is kind of the model. I'll kind of quickly run through it quickly. So we have the similar indices. So we have I, J, and K. Okay, and then we have this. We have this. Um, we have this kind of conditional expectation of for all species. This is kind of consistent across all sites for all species. Okay, and then so we have this kind of latent variable, which is kind of represents the the RCP. Okay, and so. Um, for species at uh, sites i, sites i species j, have this latent variable uh, i at site i for RCP k essentially. Okay, all right, and then we have this kind of alpha j, which is the intercepts of the species. This is the kind of random variable. This kind of the tor here um, helps us. It's kind of like a switching function that tells us which RCP we're in. Um, this, this is kind of like an indicator function is said, if that, if that makes sense to people. All right. And then we can also, um, adjust the profile of species based on say sampling effort or artifacts. Okay. And this is this where gamma J comes in. So this is, this, um, W I or W is a design matrix of covariates that represent say sampling artifacts. Okay. And so now I'll, I'll show that in the, in the code as well, if we get to that, hopefully where the example that I present, there's like a seasonal artifact in when data was collected. And then if you don't correct for that, that can give you kind of like spurious or artificial regions essentially, okay? All right, and so we kind of, the pi i is kind of this, this expectation of that random variable, okay? So what, that, what does that mean? That means, well, we kind of have this, this random variable that we're trying to estimate from the data and then pi is essentially the expectation of that. So the probability of observing that, okay, that random variable. And then we can fit this through like a multinomial regression. So the multinomial brings in, this is how we describe the, um, the environmental covariates that describe that, that group of sites essentially. Okay, and they come in here. So this equation looks a bit horrendous, but it's not that, it's just a multinomial. And then this is the, this um, beta k, is the coefficients that describe the environmental covariates that describe that group of sites. And the X is that design matrix that describes that. Okay, and so this is the example that I'll, I'll go through in the R code. Um, so basically it's this, this is work done by Nicole Hill. So it's done this Kerguelen area down here, which is this um, fishery. Um, and then essentially you can get these kind of predictions which I'll go through, okay. All right, so I'm kind of already going or you half an hour in. But um, so essentially, yeah, in summary, the kind of model-based approaches, which can do this kind of, we wanna have information on grouping of sites, grouping of species, okay? We can do lots of nice things like prediction, uncertainty, diagnostics, which we'll get through in the R code. Um, they kind of help the simplification of this message because we're taking say multiple species, say tens or hundreds or thousands of species. And we're, we're present, presenting them into say uh, like, five, 10, 20 groups, okay, and to, to help communicate those kind of major trends in the data, okay. Um, I guess this is also potentially a downside because um, there can be sometimes be an oversimplification. So if you have, if you really want to understand, have a really good predictive model, something like a joint distribution model might be more what you need to do. Um, there's some extensions. I'll just quickly give a plug on some of these extensions. So this is some work by a PhD student, um, August. From the University of Melbourne, and he's we've been developing a point process version of species archetype model. So this is a model that can deal with presence only data. He works on um, on fungi, and this is one of the one of ten archetype maps that he produced for Australia, um, where he's got like some huge amount of occurrence records in the model, and then you can get this kind of this predicted intensity. These are kind of the based on the cell size, the expected number of fungi they would observe, and then there's some uncertainty. Okay, and so um, Scott and myself have been working on these for SAMs and RCPs, okay? And 
recently as well, Scott and um, Jano van Hootelen and Jeff Hozak. Um, so Jano is from the University of Helsinki and um, Jeff's also a, a statistician at CSIRO. They've extended um, RCPs um, with Gaussian processes to make them spatial temporal. So you can kind of do spatial temporal bioregions. So this plot here, essentially, these are the rows of years and the columns, the RCPs, and it's kind of, they all kind of the same, like superficially, but if you look closely, you can see that the kind of, the, the probabilities of them change a bit over time. Okay, so this is kind of, you had dynamic regions you wanted to manage. This might be an approach you could, you could play with. Okay, all right. And so, yeah, like I said, before embarking on, um, I guess an analysis and jumping into it, you kind of want to make sure that you want to do a study that understands how species group or how sites group. Um, mixture models provide a great tool for exploration and communication. So often we use them often as like almost a first pass that we want to understand a complex system, but they're not the only approach. Okay. So there's lots of other approaches um, for doing multivariate statistics stuff like hypothesis testing. So MV abund is a classic example of this. Um, joint distribution modeling, um, so things like um, Otso over Skydance package, HMISC. And there's also other versions that kind of packages that do similar things to RCPs and SAMs. So um, I think Dennis's um, latent Dirichlet allocation stuff is a kind of does similar things as well, which is a really neat, neat approach. Okay, and then I've, I've got a bunch of references um, which people can then um, peruse in their own leisure. leisure. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll post these slides online and then people can go through that if they need. Okay, all righty. So hopefully we'll get to some R code. All right, so um, I thought we'd run through the um, species archetype models first. Um, there is a rendered HTML version in the code of R Markdown for people who, aren't, who know how to use R or who are familiar with R Markdown. Okay, and so basically it just takes this, this code and it makes into a HTML that has all the figures embedded in it and stuff. But I'll just run through it. Um, and hopefully we've got enough time to get through them both. I'll try and go quickly so that um, we can touch on both SAMs and RCPs. Okay, so I won't go through the model, um, but that's basically just a description of the model that we talked through in the slides. Okay, and this example essentially, um, I didn't really have a good example that wasn't like a huge data set for species archetype models. So it wasn't really convenient to run that like in a online tutorial. So I thought the easiest thing to do was um, simulate a data set and then, um, and then talk through that and how we might, I try to simulate it kind of like with um, something that was kind of close to kind of ecological reality and then um, talk about some of the decisions we make when we're kind of feeding these models some of the things we have to deal with. Um, yeah, and then I guess some of the inference we can make when we're doing it. So um, there's a bunch of packages that um, you might not have installed, but if you have, that's great. Um, I guess the main one is Ecomix. Um, there's a, you can install it. I'm kind of been working, making some updates on the dev branch. Um, so that's what I'm gonna be using for this presentation. So if you try and install the old branch, there's probably some function that will break because I've changed some of the names and stuff like that. But hopefully if you install the dev branch, it will work for you. Okay. All right. So basically we're just going to um, simulate some environmental covariates. Okay. So if I, I'm just going to run this chunk of code and basically all this is doing, doing is generating um, some simulated data, which are like themselves are Gaussian processes. Okay. And then we can, this set of code here is just a, some code to plot those things. So it's gonna, some, this is basically do some color palettes, plot them and then plot the covariates. And then we, if I run that. And Skip, um, Skip can I interrupt hmm. real quick? Could sure. you um, zoom in a little bit on the code? Oh, sure, yeah. I can actually make it, how about I make it full screen? Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Is that better? 18 size font? Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right. All right. So 
hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's a bit better. So essentially, we, I've just simulated these covariates, which are kind of representing kind of like marine kind of things we might expect to see. So you will kind of get the, the vibe over this next bit of coding sessions that I've, you know, worked a lot of marine systems. So we kind of got temperature, oxygen, we've got some depth and some productivity. Okay. And we're going to use these as our kind of like, this is our study area that we're going to simulate some data and then we're going to try and build a space circuit model and then predict into towards the end. Okay. So we want to then simulate some data that represents kind of like an ecological community that we might see in sample. Okay. And so um, this is just some code that runs through basically setting up the species intercepts. Okay. And we can plot those. And so what I'm doing here is I'm basically generating um, uh, kind of using a beta distribution beta distribution to generate like a density um, which essentially has kind of like more rare species, which is kind of what we typically see in kind of, you know, marine samples, even terrestrial samples like invertebrates. We have these long tails of like rare species essentially. Okay, so we're gonna try and recreate that in the, in, the, in the simulated data. Okay, so we kind of have this kind of thing that we get. So we kind of, this is our, this is our, our beta distribution of density that we're gonna, we're gonna sample from. And these are kind of the, the kind of prevalences of species that we're going to observe across our, 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 our study area. Okay. So um, basically what this is saying is there's lots of things that are going to have rare prevalences. So between zero, they've got a probability of occurring between zero and 0.2. And there's going to be a few things that are, that are, that are common that are everywhere. So they've got a probability of being 0.3 or intercept, sorry. So an average um, prevalence. Okay. All right. And so then we can then, um, yeah, so we've got those. Okay, and then we're going to set up a bunch of archetype responses to the covariate. So we're going to use um, quadratics or second degree polynomials, which are basically, so we're going to be able to have linear, we're going to have like basically curves you know, with humps in them essentially. Um, okay, and so what we're going to do, this kind of code here, um, what this is doing I guess is um, we're setting up a coefficient. We're simulating a coefficient for eight, for three archetypes. So we're going to have a model that has three archetypes. Okay, and so archetype one is going to have a coefficient of 0.75 for uh, linear temperature, and it's going to have negative 0.75 for the the second degree polynomial. Okay, and then there's a bunch of these that will get simulated and then that will help us get these nice kind of responses and curves in the, in the model once we fit it um, and we can do some prediction, we can see that. So I run that and that just prints them. We get this matrix of, so we're gonna have this temperature, the covariates and these archetypes and these are the kind of the true parameters that we're gonna simulate from. We've also got a, a time effect in here, okay? And so this is kind of gonna represent uh, when the sample was taken, okay? So we're gonna use that as well. Okay, we're then gonna take um, a random subset of the data. So basically um, we've got our, this Envirodar frame is all is those environmental covariates that we simulated above. We're gonna simulate 200 sites. Okay, we're gonna randomly take 200 sites from, those, from that entire area. Okay, and we're gonna then use that as our, um, as our data frame that we're going to simulate the species data from. Okay. Okay. So in, I guess this is a good place to talk about the formula structures in, in um, species mix and regional mix. So um, it's kind of the way we set up a formula in, in species mix and in, in eco mix is similar to how you'd set up with a GLIM. So if you're used to using GLMs or GAMs. Okay. But the only, the main difference is we can have, we have a, a kind of different formula structure for the left-hand side of the model, which is the response. So we kind of use this C-bind, um, this C-bind kind of uh, argument, which means that we can kind of subset the data um, or set up the model in different ways without actually changing the model matrix that goes into all the, that goes into the, into the fit. So we can kind of, if we wanted to, we could remove a species by, just by changing the formula rather than redoing the whole the whole model fit. Okay, so that's kind of why we use that. 
but it's a little bit cumbersome to get your head around at first setting this up. But then once you get used to it, it's great because you can just say, well, I just want to fit the first 10 species or I want to fit the first a random 20 species or I want to fit all 100 species. Okay. So that's kind of why we use that. All right. And then once we've got all that, we can set this up. We're going to simulate um, a binomial um, response. So this will be presence or absence or uh, so actually a Bernoulli, but so. Um, is a species present in a site or is it absence in a site based on those covariates we set up and the intercepts, okay? All right, and so by passing this to the formula, this poly temperature degree equals two, um, and then it will then tell the model to, it's gonna, it's expecting you to see like a polynomial. So two, two degrees of freedom. So it sees covariates, okay? If you don't pass the right formula structure, we'll throw an error. Okay, so that's just something to think about. All right, so we can then simulate that. And then we can then, um, once we simulate it, we'll get this something that looks like this, okay? So, well, it's not a very good first few rows, but basically we'll have the, the covariates, um, okay? And then we're gonna have the species. So I've just chose the first five and then the sites and presence or absence, okay? Um, the const here is just an intercept, okay? Right, and then there's a bunch of different attributes within the simulated data, okay, which can, we can look at the SAMs, the PIs. So we can look at, um, yeah, so we can just, there's a bunch of different things there. So we could look at say attributes, um, similar, I hope, I hope it won't look like a full myself here. So the data and then we'll say, Pi, okay, and that gives us the kind of mixing proportions in the model that are still simulated. Okay, so there's like roughly thirty percent or thirty-three percent in each um, archetype. Okay, all the species belong to each archetype. Okay, all right. So now that we've kind of set up the data, we kind of need to think about well, how are we going to model these? Okay, um, and there's a few kind of things we think about when we're doing this. Okay, so should we model all those hundred species? Um, and which ones should we include? Um, how many groups should we choose to represent those hundred species? Okay, so these are kind of some of these questions that, um, um, yeah, and then obviously what, what are the functional forms that we might use to describe the archetypes? Okay, now we're kind of, this becomes a bit more complicated when you're dealing with real world data sets because you don't know what the responses are and you don't know how many groups there are, but because I've simulated data, I do, um, but that kind of, working out which covariates to fit and how many groups to, to fit is also is an important part of the model fitting process. Okay, so um, Francis Hui, who um, he's done a lot of work on joint distribution models and mixture models. Um, he had some work that he did in his PhD with Scott, um, David Warden, and they showed that, you know, you could fit essentially more rare species using this kind of mixture model approach. So it's kind of one of the arguments why that people use joint distribution models for these kind of approaches. You can say compared to doing say single species models, you can incorporate, I guess, more rare species into the models, make inference on species you potentially couldn't um, if you were fitting them as a single model and it's kind of because this whole idea of like borrowing strength, okay? All right, so we're gonna kind of, go with that argument and we're going to basically we're going to cut off the species we use at um we're going to cut off anything that has less than 10 um occurrences so this x-axis is number of occurrences that per species and then the y-axis is the count of species that so there's lots you can see there's more species that have rare occurrences so we're going to chuck those away and we're just going to model the species that are kind of more prevalent across our sites. Okay, so once we've kind of done that, we're gonna, down here, we're gonna do that. We're gonna, well, we're gonna load it. Well, I've already loaded it up before, but we load Ecomix. We, um, we're gonna grab our species data, which is the first hundred rows, because that's what we simulated. We're gonna then remove this little argument here is gonna basically remove species that have less than 10 occurrences. Okay, all right. And then we're gonna use that data to fit our model, okay? We're gonna set up the formula in the same similar way. So we're gonna have this polynomial of temperature 
Um, we're leaving them as raw polynomials. You can fit orthogonal ones if you want, um, but because the data is already centered and scaled because it's, it's a Gaussian, um, we don't really have to bother, bother too much with that. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and then, and then we have our time and then we basically fit the model. So hopefully this will run. Okay. And it's going a bit slow. Okay, and essentially what it does, what the model does um, when it fits it is it uses a two-step fitting kind of approach, okay? Which can be a bit slow for large data sets, but it's kind of um, how we kind of do it. So um, it does this thing, it does what's called the EM or ECM algorithm to find decent starting values. So, and then once it's found those values, it then, um, it passes it to like quasi-Newton optimization. But the thing about quasi-Newton is it, it's quite unstable. Uh, it's not very good if it, the starting values aren't that good. So you kind of got to get decent starting values and then pass it to quasi-Newton. Okay. All right. So that's kind of our, we fitted our model and then we can, um, we can look at, you know, we get all these, we print all these things out of it. Um, so we kind of get the mixing not super great, but you know, it's kind of getting the mixing coefficients similar to that third, 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 some a bit more going to archetype three. Um, anyway, and we could then compare these, the intercepts or the betas to the, to the, the true ones. Okay. All right. So if we looked at beta, betas, okay. And then we looked at, uh, what's it called? Um, we can see we're kind of, oh, hopefully that's good. We can see we're kind of recapturing those parameters. So, you know, we've got for the time, we're kind of getting pretty close. Um, this one, negative, negative one, these are basically zero, negative point, 2.5, negative 2.5, there's a one there. So yeah, we kind of see we're recapturing um, the simulated data, which is, which is good. Because if that wasn't happening, I would be worried. Okay, all right. Now, now if because we kind of know the number of the groups and we kind of because of simulated data, we might necessarily have to do this approach. But typically, what we would have to do is work out a, do this model selection. Okay, so um, okay, so we have to do um, model selection. And so what, what the one thing we, like I said earlier in the talk is we don't know, we don't know K, okay? We don't know the number of groups, okay? And, and this is latent, okay? And so we can, we can assign any number of latent variables, um, number of groups to the model, but we wanna try and use the model and characteristics of the model to help us estimate those number of groups, okay? Okay, and we can do this based on the log likelihood. So we can say, we can fit a bunch of different numbers of archetypes or RCPs, if we're fitting an RC, a regional mixed model, okay? And then we could help us to estimate which is the best number of groups that model. And so Nicole Hill, she had a paper out uh, last year, which kind of looked at kind of doing model-based bioregionalization or equalization. And she kind of found that if you knew the number of groups, there was lots of like a few methods that did quite well at kind of recreating the kind of bioregionalization statistically, but if you didn't know the number of groups, um, kind of RCP model did quite well at when species mix did quite well at finding it because you can use it, this, this one step approach to fit the model and then estimate the, the number of groups at the same time. Um, okay. And so I won't run this because this takes ages because it's like fitting, what it's doing is it's fitting one to six groups and then it's also doing multiple refits. So multiple re restarts, okay. But I've already, I've run it and I've saved it and it should be in the GitHub code. So if you're following along, you should be able to load this, hopefully. Okay. And then we can then um, I'll run that. Okay. All right. And then we can, so we can do basically use Bayesian information criteria, which is a form of information criteria um, to look at the, um, 
the kind of which is the best K, which is the best number of archetypes. Okay. And not surprisingly, because we simulated this data with three groups, three groups is the best. And so that's kind of what we want to see. Okay. These kind of dots up here is because I was using a multi fit approach, which has like stochastic starts, random starts. Okay. And so you can get these kind of sometimes get weird, weird fits happening. Okay. All righty. Oh, what's going on here? Let's close that. All righty. Okay, so now we've kind of fitted our model. We kind of see that we can recreate our kind of our simulated coefficients. We can um, we can do model selection on the number of groups based on um, the log likelihood. We can then start doing other diagnostics. So we might be interested in looking at say residuals. Okay, so um, Ecomix can do a bunch of different types of residuals, but the one we kind of we tend to use is um, random quantile residuals. Okay. Okay, and so these are just an approach where we, for species archetype models, we fit residuals to species, and then we can look at how the species respond. And if they kind of, you know, have a nice fit to the kind of theoretical line, then it should, you know, we hopefully the model will be doing okay. Okay, and so, um, so this is the figure, the plot we have now. So if it fits this kind of, this line here quite tightly, which like it is, that's kind of telling us that the model is doing a decent job of describing the observations with the, this distribution, with the Bernoulli distribution, okay? There's a little bit of stuff happening down here. So it's not quite, so for the rare, uh, more common things, it's maybe a little bit skewed, but yeah, that's not too bad, okay? Now we can look at the, we can also look at say a single species, okay? So we can, we can um, look at a, Okay, so we can pull up a single species. This is species three. Uh, it's a kind of a rare species. This is plotting it on the probability scale. So this is kind of the, but we can also, we can, I think we can put it on the, um, oh, I can't remember how to do it at the top of my head. You can, we can put this, this fitted value on the logistic scale if you want, and it'll make it look less clustered, um, which can be useful. Okay, now, um, that's kind of like we've done residuals we've done model selection in a very quick way and obviously you would spend more time doing this when you're doing the analysis for real you'd probably think you know um, it would take longer to interpret all this but kind of trying to do this quickly okay so we we want to try and um, get an estimate of uncertainty for our our means for our predictions and um, the way we kind of do this there's a few different ways we can do this um, in Nicomix. Um we can do we can kind of estimate the Hessian um, um, numerically. So basically what that means is um, we essentially in the model, in the kind of back end of the code in the C++ code, we have the log likelihood and the gradient um, written out analytically. Okay. And then we can use that analytical gradient to numerically estimate the second derivative, which is the Hessian. Okay. Essentially. Okay. And then um, once we have that, we can then solve that to get the variance covariance matrix. I call it invert it to get the variance covariance matrix. And that will give us the standard errors per each of these kind of model coefficients. So that's one way to do it. But the kind of the problem with that approach is it's a bit slow. Um, no, no, it's quick, but it's unstable. Sorry. Okay, so another, another approach is which we tend to use is using this Bayesian bootstrap. Okay, and essentially what this does is just bootstraps the data, um, but it has a nice characteristics where it doesn't remove any of the observations from the model. So it uses like a Drishley um, kind of weighting in the model, in the Bayesian bootstrap to kind of keep all the observations in, which can be really important for, for you don't want to remove too many sites or species because then you might get different groupings. And the same with the RCPs, you don't want to remove too many sites because then you might get different kind of um, answers essentially. So that was, if you use like a case resample bootstrap. Okay, right. So um, we can fit this. This will probably take, hopefully not too long. I probably should have already, probably should have. Sorry. 
my computer's chugging along. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to that. Oh no, I, I need that actually. I need an object. Um, yeah, okay. Um, is there anything I missed up here? I'll just quickly go back. Uh, well, we're waiting for that. I guess I would say like in the, when you're fitting the species mix model, there's a whole bunch of different controls you can use. Like if you're doing a glim, so you can mess around with the, like how many ECMs you fit, um, this kind of stuff. So sometimes for more complicated models, the local likelihoods are more we're harder to estimate. You can use like multiple refits of like the ECM or you can use, you know, different convergence kind of, you know, strictness and this kind of stuff to get you a better fit. So I've just kept it really simple for this example, but um, that's one thing to think about. Um, yeah, and then I guess I haven't met, I didn't really talk about this in the in the talk or up to now, but we can also, um, actually no, I'm gonna skip that. Cause up to, up to, we'd be hanging, sorry about that. Okay, so now we've got our bootstrap object. So this will basically give us for each of those coefficients, we'll have a, a, another, a new estimate based on this Bayesian bootstrap essentially. And then we can use that to generate um, essentially uncertainty in predictions or if we want to do like partial response plots, et cetera. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to do some partial response plots or effect, effect, effect plots, okay? And this will show us the relationship between the species or archetype groups and the environmental covariates, okay? Hopefully that will work. Okay, yeah, all right. So... Okay, so basically, as I said earlier, I simulated a bunch of, I should have showed these, sorry, I apologize. I should have actually showed you these plots to start with so you could see the responses we were getting. Um, but basically I kind of simulated so I would have these some, some things which are kind of zero, they're kind of flat, not responding, flattish, not responding. Some things have nice uniform humps and some things have like positive, positive or negative relationships with say depth. So this, so, you know, here archetype one um, likes a deep, um, archetype two likes it in the middle and then archetype three likes a cello, okay? And so if thinking back to that figure in our talk, there would be a hundred species that have a response to this. Um, and then we're distilling it down to these three archetypes, okay? All right, um, we can, I'm gonna, skip that because that's showing a link function, which, which is not interesting. Okay, but then we can say we can, so if we want to see the species, um, how the species respond, we can do that using this function as well. So we can plot them, we can change the response variable to species and it will do the conditional predictions for each species based on the archetype, okay? And it'll look, it'll look quite similar to the archetype predictions, the partial, partial response plots. All right, so there you go. So, you know, for the depth one, we have the same thing where archetype one, they're all, you know, they all like it deep. Archetype two, they like it middle depth. Then archetype three, they like it, they like it shallow, okay? All right, I mean, you can see that we're taking, the what well, the archetype is kind of taking the average of those fits, essentially, the mean of those fits. You kind of think of it in that way, okay? All right, and so it looks, it's kind of hard to interpret for with all the species lumped together, but you can see. And these kind of lines vary because um, the intercepts vary for these species, okay? All right, and then we can also do stuff if we really wanted to, we can kind of do like a richness or something or like total abundance by summing over, over species, okay? So um, if, we, if we want to like look at like say richness across the gradient or total abundance across the gradient, we can then do that as well by, by using this kind of sum, species sum call. So it's gonna sum the kind of cumulative probability or the probabilities across the gradient essentially for all species. Okay, and so you get this, um, so based on 
you know, depth, you know, the probabilities for the middle group were much lower. So you kind of got this weird like UE thing happening where there's like the, the deep and the shallow groups emerges, you know, more rich. Okay. So that's kind of uh, nice. I think you can get out of it. Okay. So like productivity, like here, for argument's sake, if you look up here, you know, we can see that uh, archetype three, you know, there was like a lot higher you know, probabilities of prevalences of those, of those species. And that kind of comes out as, you know, this kind of higher richness essentially across productivity, lower productivity. Okay. All right. So um, another thing we're interested in when we're doing the kind of species stack up is working out which species belong to which group. Okay. And so this is what we're kind of estimating in the model. What's the membership of each species of each group? It's an important part of the model. And so these are the tours in the in this species stack type model. Okay. All right. And we can plot those as well. So essentially, um, you know, if you had, this is an, also a nice place to do model checking and um, as well. So if you had, you know, groups of species as a biologist, you knew that kind of like belong together, you can look at them, you know, so like the red is, is like basically one and, and the kind of the yellowy color is, is zero. So one is present in this archetype. Okay. And then, so basically if you had groups of species that kind of clustered together in this tall uh, kind of object, and that might tell you that the model is kind of doing a decent job of, of grouping your species based on your biological intuition. Okay. All right. Um, finally, I think the last bit. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We've gone. This has gone a bit longer than I thought. Um, we can do spatial prediction, which is often more interested in producing maps of where these things occur in space. Okay. And um, yeah, I'll just quickly run through that. slow my computer seems to be going slow maybe it's zoom okay and so i've passed this prediction function um so what i've done here is essentially um i've passed time as night so because it's a factor you kind of have to choose one of the levels okay so i said well we're going to predict what's how our predictions look like at nighttime. Okay. And then, um, and then essentially we're going to pass the sand, sand model. We're going to pass the bootstrapped objects and we're going to pass this kind of end dot data frame, which was the kind of the full set of covariates that we simulated at the start. It's been quite slow. Why is it not slow? It shouldn't, doesn't normally go this slow. So I don't know what's happening. I guess that's probably what all the code is say. Okay. So Skip, while it's running, would you mind mm. if I asked one of the one question that's already in the poll app.com? Sure, yeah, no worries. Um, so there's a question here. Um, are the archetypes supposedly independent of one another? Um, so what is that? Sorry, what was, can you repeat the question? Are, I think it is, is the underlying assumption in, in SAMS that their archetypes are, are going to be independent of, of each other? Yeah, so it assumes that there's conditional independence across, yeah, across the archetypes, across species. So yeah, so that's one of the assumptions. Um, yeah, and so that's just how we, that's how we get the model to work essentially, assuming this conditional independence, yeah. So, so I think it contrasts with uh, joint species distribution models, right? Because then there's no borrowing of strengths uh, between species that are in different ar archetypes, right? Because they are assumed to be independent then. It yeah, so it's, um, so basically you can think of it like in compared to joint distribution models, you can almost think of the archetypes as like a block covariant structure, essentially. So the species that in an archetype are kind of all correlated. And then they're kind of, if you think about the covariant structure of say a joint distribution model, um, it would be like taking the latent variables in the 
in the covariant structure of a latent of a latent variable GLM or a joint distribution model, um, and making them discrete essentially. So that's kind of what it's doing. Yeah. So um, so yeah, like in so I don't know. I'm not an expert in joint distribution models, but some of them they have like the ability to do have like latent factors in the covariant structure. Okay. And so it's kind of like, it's almost like a continuous, like a PCA almost kind of idea on the, I could be completely wrong here, but I think this this kind of continuous kind of, um, yeah, like a factor in the in that covariant structure. So SAMs or species archetype models are basically doing a similar thing, but it's taking, distilling them down to like a cluster, to a discrete group, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's another question here, if there's a way to make a trait-based inference on archetype composition within the model. So if, as in my understanding is, if you wanted to take into account traits of the different species and try to understand how that influences, I don't know if the probability of belonging to, to a given archetype or something along those lines. You can't, you can't do it in the way that say HMIS can do it. So like having like is the traits in the model, um, you'd have to do it through covariates. So it's not the same thing. So I will say, I'm going to say no, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you, you can't do it in the same way. Yeah. 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 But you could, you could have like traits as covariates on the grouping. So it's like, you know, we believe that these, you know, these species group together because of these traits for argument's sake, but you can't have it in the same way that say that HMISC has it in the, I can't remember how it works, but yeah, that has it in a different structure. I know that. Yeah. So, so I guess in, in this regard, you could always do post hoc, right? You could figure out which species belong to which archetypes and then try to figure out if they are, they share common traits or common characteristics, yeah, uh, yeah. but not necessarily all sort of in a single step. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So there's actually a, in that, oh, in that slides that I put up, um, the, one of the references is, um, by a lady, Rebecca Leeper, and she did a paper called Do Communities Exist? And they looked at, they used species archetype models to look at so intertidal um, kind of rocky reefs kind of distributions. And that one of the things they looked at was kind of like post hoc, the kind of the distribution of traits across those reefs and those groups. So yeah, you can do that kind of stuff. So that might, if someone's interested in that kind of work, that might give them some clues on how they could do that with this model. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, and I'll just quickly run this and then um, okay, and then we can get this kind of figure out, which is our prediction of the archetype. So you know, um, I should have had the kind of the true response on the left, so I apologize for that. But trust me, this kind of re 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 relates to that kind of simulated response essentially okay and then we can go because this is a group so blue is the high probabilities and brown is the low probabilities um you know this is kind of this was a kind of a depth liking species so if you remember that or middle depth liking species yep okay and then um obviously you get uncertainty as well so this is kind of standard error okay that's another thing you can also predict it you can also plot it as a um like a credible interval if you want as well. So you can do, you know, upper and lower confidence intervals if you like that kind of way of plotting things. Okay, so that's kind of Sam's. Uh, all right, so um, right, I'll quickly go through RCPs, all right? So essentially I'm gonna talk to that example, the, the work that Nicole Hill did looking at the Kerguelen, so um, Antarctic fishes. So essentially, this is an actual real world example. So this will hopefully resonate with people a bit better than a simulated data set. So, um, so that, as I figure I showed that Kerguelen plateau area is like the herd of McDonald Island is like a really productive fishery for Australia. So essentially they fish things like Patagonian toothfish down there and ice fish. It's super biodiverse. There's like whales and birds and all sorts of like interesting bycatch species they catch. Um, and so Nicole was kind of did his paper um, with Scott and she's done a follow-up paper as well, um, looking at this region and trying to understand the kind of bioregionalization or the eco-regionalization of this area. And she used regions of common profiles to do that. Okay. And so this is um, this is kind of a very this is like a simple, like a cut-down version of kind of like the paper that she published in 2017. 
I think in diversity and distributions, um, but it's basically, it will give you the kind of gist of, of, of what she did and, and how she, she went about doing, fitting these models and the inference she wanted to try and make. Okay, so that was, these are just the equations from the talk. I won't go through those because we'll just run through the code. Okay, so there's, um, Nicole actually provided me with some code to run these analysis. So there's in the, in the GitHub account, in the GitHub um, folder, there's a, um, basically an R, like an R folder, and then it's an alpha functions. And, all, and basically all they do is they just help us um, kind of transpose the data into like a nice structure, like a centralized and center and standardize the data essentially in a nice way. Okay, so I'll just load those packages. Hope they all, all installed, yep. Okay, and then I'll load up the data and I'll plot it. Oh, that plot? Oh no, I know why. I've got a check in line. There we go. Let's try that again. There we go. All right. So this is the kind of Kilgallen area. So it's like just looks like a blob, but basically it's like this subantarctic island. Okay. And then in this data set, this was done. These are the kind of the first, some of the first commercial trawl like research trawl surveys they did down there in the early 90s. So I think it was like 1990, 91, 92, 93. Okay. Um, and basically there's kind of this seasonal effect in the data. So um, depending on the year, I think in 1990, they went in autumn, winter. Um, and then 92, 93, they went spring and summer. So there's kind of, and what happens is because this is a subantarctic island, the kind of fish like migrate a bit up and down like with the water temperature. So they're like, they kind of, you know, well, they move to deeper places or they move to move up and down to try and adjust with that change in the kind of, that kind of subantarctic front essentially. Okay. All right. And so we're going to try and model these and generate like a simple eco regionalization for this, this um, kind of this, this, this study. Okay. All right. And so the, this kind of data set we have, I think there's, um, so run this. So we have fish or species. There's about 20 species of fish or 15. There you go. Okay. And then, so for instance, this guy here, you so Cindius Elonidius, I kind of pronounce, I can't, my Latin needs some work, but they, um, that's uh, the pagan toothfish. Okay. All right. And so that's kind of a, Keep that in mind because you'll see that that's kind of like quite abundant in all the RCPs. And that's a not interesting thing about RCPs is that unlike SAMs, SAMs kind of like you kind of have species in a group or another group where RCPs can, you know, it's they can have different abundances across multiple groups, which is a feature of it. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. We'll, we'll plot up the covariate data again. Okay. Um, just to show you what we'll be, what we'll be trying to predict to. So um, we have, there's a quite a strong longitudinal effect in this data set. And that's because um, majority of the fishery is actually on the kind of, on the east side of the kind of Kuguayan Plateau. So we want, they, Nicole wanted to capture that. Um, it's also a strong bathymetric effect. So the kind of the commercial fish they target the ice fish are relatively shallow and then the kind of paddock and toad fish are quite deep. Okay, so there's all, they tend to be deeper. Okay, so this is kind of effect. Okay, and then there's temperature. And so this is this is kind of the covariate she provided. Um, and temperature is, this is temperature at the sea floor. Okay, so you can see that it is kind of correlated, a bit correlated with bathymetry. Okay, and this comes from the, like a regional fesson, like a regional oceanographic um, Antarctic um, circulation model. Okay. Right. So that's the kind of data. All right. And then we, we set up the, um, formula in the simulator SAMs. Okay. So we have this kind of, we have this kind of C bind, the species names, and then we have the, uh, the covariates, um, the code that Nicole provided, which is in that, if you ran through it, it does, um, rather than using the poly or the, the poly raw equals two call it, it, um, kind of like transforms them and then gives them like this like name like so this is poly one poly two 
log depth one, log depth two, seafloor temperature one, two. So these are kind of like the quadratics. Okay. And then we've got this seasonal effect in the species. Um, so this is kind of slightly different from SAMS. Oh, I forgot to mention that earlier. SAMS kind of has like a, just an intercept for the species model. Okay. Where um, the RCP model can have this kind of seasonal effect to control for differences in this, the profile of the species. Okay. And so in this model, we control for season. Okay. All right. So we're trying to remove the effect of season out of the model, essentially. Okay. All right, um, now I'm not gonna run this because this does like a multi-fit. Um, so basically there's kind of a few ways. So the log likelihoods in RCPs are, are typically more complicated than they are in SAMs, okay? All right, and so, um, and it's just because this kind of mixture expert model is slightly harder to estimate, okay? So there's some kind of like tricks that we kind of use to kind of kind of fit these models. And so the kind of default, you can fit like just a single regional mix model, but to kind of converge on a, on a maximum, the maximum likelihood, okay? We tend to use um, this multiple fitting approach, okay? All right, and that's kind of what we use. So we can use this regional mix dot multi-fit um, function call. We can also, um, one of the other things we can do with, with um, RCP models or regional mix and these other models is we can include penalties in the model, okay? So penalties are kind of like, we can kind of think them as like priors or the kind of ways to um, kind of kind of grease the, world, the wheels of like a lot model fitting essentially, a smooth the log likelihood a tiny bit, okay? And so um, I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but basically like these are, these, the penalty on tails, gammas and dispersion. So this is a, we're fitting a negative binomial model for this data because we've got, so I haven't mentioned that either, sorry. All right, I'll mention that first. <laughs> so if basically, we've, because we've got count data, okay? So we've got counts of fishes at sites, we're gonna fit a negative binomial distribution to this model, okay? To account for those and to capture those counts, okay? All right, and then when we fit a negative binomial model, we're kind of we're fitting the counts, okay? And then we have this dispersion parameter that we estimate to. The dispersion parameter, this counts for the kind of over dispersion in the count data. So I'm sure lots of people are familiar with negative binomial models and kind of how they're kind of extensions of like Poisson models. And yeah, so that's kind of what we're using. Okay. And then we can put penalties on that term essentially. Okay. We can also, this first penalty is like a penalty on the, on the RCPs. Okay. And this is, this uses like a, something that's kind of similar to a Dirichlet prior, essentially. So it's like a uniform kind of Dirichlet. So with a little bit of smoothing, okay? All right, so probably too much detail, but that's, yeah, kind of, we can have penalties and we can do multi-fits. That's the kind of take-home message, okay? All right, so we can, we can say we fit that model. It's not, actually not too, too slow. I'm not gonna run it just because um, of time. Okay, but I've, I've saved it. So I'm gonna load it and then we can, we can plot them up and we can look at similar to how we're doing model selection. We wanna work out, <clears throat> um, you know, what's the best number of, of RCPs or, or regions of common profile to or eco regions to describe these data that we're seeing for these 15, 15 fish species. Okay, so I run this and then we can, looks we're doing this multiple fits. I did in this, Example, I did 10 refits for each of each archetype group. I removed the group one because they're all the same and they're all up here somewhere. Okay, all right. Um, and then so we can see that in this example too, three archetypes is the best model based on BIC. Fours is, is, is probably, I would say plausible. So if, if you had an affinity for four groups, you could potentially use that. But then as you can see, as we add, start adding more groups, the log, the BIC um, starts to not do as well. So log likelihood is not doing as well. And the penalty, the penalties on the extra parameters that, that are used to fit five and six groups start to penalize that log likelihood. Okay. All right. So once um, this is kind of like a, just a mechanical thing we have to do with the RCP models when we're using the multi-fit approach is that actually the data structures that come back when we're fitting it can become quite large. So you end up with, you know, these huge um, kind of like huge model objects, okay? And so 
kind of a way that we got around that by was by um well that's actually scott came up with this was um he you just don't record you don't return the all the kind of objects you need for like residuals and prediction and this kind of stuff you just return like the bare bones of the model okay and then if you then once you've decided on the model you think is the best model based on the multiple fits you then refit it um with and by passing the best models um, coefficients as starting values as initialization initials okay minutes okay so this should run really quickly um yep i ran didn't even print uh oh, i had quiet equals true Okay, so basically, this is kind of what you would get typically get out of a RCP model when it gets fitted. So it just gives you some uh, some summaries of the. So it's got three RCPs. It's 181 um, fully present observations. So what's that mean? That means that potentially you can have um, sometimes you can have sites that are um, you know they're the same sites but they're multi visited multiple times. Like there's like a temporal element in the data set. Okay. All right, 15 species. This is the model structure we're using, the model for the species. We're fitting a, the error family is a negative binomial. Okay, and then we're, we're past the quasi Newton optimization. And because we passed the kind of the already fitted model, kind of the initialization, it's already converged. So it just goes, okay, it converged. All right. And so if this something weird happens here, like it, if you do this and it, and it's like the, it starts optimizing again or it does something weird, then you've probably passed the wrong. Um, the wrong coefficient. So that, that's happened to me a few times when I've like changed the number of groups by accident and then passed like the coefficients for like a model for the number of groups. So it's just something to be aware of if you if you start playing with playing with RCPs. Okay. All right. And so once again we can do di diagnostics. Um, so once we've we've done model selection on the groups, um, one thing I haven't mentioned in both approaches is doing model selection on the coefficients. Okay. And so Typically, what we do is we we um, we use like BIC or information criteria to work out the number of groups, and then once we with kind of like the full covariate model, and then once we we find the number of groups, the number of RCPs, the number of archetypes, we kind of fix that. We say we are we believe three is is the best model, three groups, three RCPs is the best model, and then we could then do say some kind of forward backwards all model selection on the covariate. So we, if there were say redundant covariates in the in describing the RCP, so say for instance, longitude had no effect in the model, we could then like do some forward or backward selection on those to remove those out of the model if we, if we so desired. I haven't done that here, um, but yeah, it's something we can do. And Nicole does that in the diversity distributions paper on the Kuguelan data set on the on different subset of this data, different, a bigger version of this data set. Okay. All right. So she removes kind of like redundant variables in the, the describing the RCPs or the, the, the ecoregions. Okay. Once again, we can look at residuals. Okay. And um, yeah, looking good, looking great. Now residuals is, of, is something to um, look out for when fitting abundance data. Okay. So you can um, often, if you say, if we were to fit a Poisson, um, you might have like essentially skewed residuals, okay? And then by moving to a negative binomial model, you can then hopefully correct for the, that skewedness with the dispersion parameter. Now, sometimes that doesn't work as well. And there's not much we can do beyond that with us with Ecomix because we can't do things like zero inflated models or anything like that. But um, yeah, there are weight or hurdle models, but there are there are other software that can do those, those kind of things. So if you have like a data set that you can't fit a negative of counts and you can't fit negative binomial or pos onto it, you could, yeah, you might have to use a different package to do, yeah, some other more complicated, um, yeah, um, form, um, density distribution. Sorry. Okay. Um, now, one thing we can look at. So what one thing that I haven't mentioned as well, which is really important for RCPs and for SAMs is cross-validation, okay? And so we can't really do cross-validation in the way you can with a species model in, in SAMs or RCPs. And that's because 
the predictions, the RCPs and the archetypes, they're latent, so they're unobserved. So doing cross-validation on them, you can't do like, you can't do a holdout sample of say where the archetype is and then do like a prediction because you don't actually observe that archetype, you observe the species, okay? So there are some ways you can do that if you wanna do like holdout tests or whatever, but what um, we use for RCPs is this kind of leave out kind of Cook's distance um, statistics. And what, what this does basically, it kind of takes out subsets of the data and refits the model. And then it tells us if the model kind of stays relatively stable, so it doesn't lose, uh, if the RCPs don't change dramatically or the log likelihood doesn't change dramatically, then we can kind of say, well, we think the model is quite stable. Um, even you know if we've taken out say 10 or 20 or 30 or 40% of the data or something, okay? All right, and so in this example here, what I've done is I've taken out like, I think I've, this has taken out one site, five sites, 10 sites, 20 sites, 30 sites, 40 sites, okay? Of, of 181 sites, okay? And we see how, when we can plot this up and see how stable our RCPs are, okay? All right, so the log likelihood is super stable. So it basically says flat. Um, and we can see that these values are quite small on this kind of the deviance on this side. But we can see as we start getting larger numbers, you know, archetypes two and one start to maybe degrade a little bit, but it's not too bad. And I would expect to see, if I was, be, I would start getting worried if these numbers were much larger on this side. Okay. So I think that's fine. Okay. So that's telling us that even as we remove, we've moved what? It's like 30% of the data. Um, it's still doing quite a good job of recapturing those um, random 30 sites, 30% of the sites. It's doing a, doing a good job of kind of recapturing the RCPs, okay? Um, we can look at, um, one thing to always check when you're thinking negative binary, the negative binary model is to look at the dispersion parameter, okay? And you don't basically, um, these are kind of on a log scale in the model. And so you, you want them to be positive and not like some crazy number, like up around like 99 or like a thousand or something. Okay, so this is all kind of relatively relatively good and robust. Okay, it's good. So that's, we're happy with that. Okay, and then we can do once again, uncertainty through bootstrapping. I've luckily I've saved this one previously. Okay, and so then we can then, um, we can look at the species profiles, okay, which is quite important for understanding the like kind of the abundances of species, the average abundances of species in each RCP. Okay. So we can we can fit that. So I'll run this bit of code. Okay. And so basically all this does, this function here, um, regional mix dot species profile, it takes like the fitted model, takes bootstraps, and then it will it will fit, it will return like kind of the average abundance or the kind of um, for each RCP, essentially for each species, okay? I've, I've put on the link function, link scale here, which means it's like on the linear predictor scale. So it will be um, like on the log scale, essentially. So it won't be, you won't have these huge, say some species have like very, very large numbers. So it won't have this kind of really skewed wheel looking graph. Okay, and we get this kind of thing, all right? So this kind of tells us um, for each species, kind of the average um, abundance per RCP or on the log scale, okay? All right, and so if we remember like our Patagonian two fish, this guy, he's kind of like common everywhere. And this is because he's the target species, okay? All right, so he's kind of gets, they kind of what they're after. So he's kind of common everywhere. Some of these kind of skatey things, these guys, uh, where are they, these guys? These are kind of, they're rare because they're kind of bi catchy things, okay? And then there's kind of the two fish, this guy, I'm um, sorry, the ice fish, this guy. He's kind of common, he's not common in the deep deep RCP, which you'll see in a sec, this is the deep ice one. So he's like, these guys like shallow water, okay? So that's kind of tell, you can use the, well, obviously you guys will know your species quite well and your data sets quite well, but you can, one of the, the, the good things out of RCP models compared to say SAMs is you can, look at the regions, look at the sites that are predicting that. And then you can look at kind of say the average, the profile of the species or the average kind of profile of the species in each RCP, okay? So you can, so then you could use this for management. You could say, well, we wanna manage RCP two because 
um, you know, we want to close it because it's, you know, it's a high, it's a, you know, it's a, an area of high abundance for this threatened um, skate program state. Okay, so you could use those kind of those kind of things if you wanted to. And then by protecting that, we protect all the other species. Fragment sake, if you if you want to do that kind of thing. Okay, all right. Um, and then we can also because in this model we had an sampling effect, so we looked at how we try to we try to correct for the the season that the trawl was done. Okay, in the model. Okay, and so we can show you that by base. I'm just going to plot the coefficients that represent those those sampling effects. Okay. Um, and it's the code's a bit ugly actually, so I won't go through it. But basically I'm just pulling out the so remember, I don't remember all the way back to the talk, which was seems like a while ago now. We have the the gammas, which are essentially the, the species specific um, coefficients for like sampling artifacts essentially. We're going to pull those out and plot those essentially. All right. And this is just a bunch of code to plot these up nicely essentially all right okay and so um so we had three seasonal covariates so we had um autumn winter summer and spring but because these are factors in the model like a the autumn autumn winter becomes that kind of like it we're comparing it to that essentially okay and so um so yeah we can once again see that you know the sampling artifact for say like the toothfish is it's kind of it's high confidence because there's lots of data for that species and um, it kind of stays around similar to the um, autumn winter kind of effect because that's what they're they're going for but other species there's like a strong seasonal effect so they you know the kind of escape guys they move they're like they're like summer spring they kind of shift around so if we don't control for these differences and this kind of seasonality, then we could get spurious kind of um, ecoregions emerging, okay? All right, and so this could be anything. So um, that you think you want to control for in your, in your sampling. So this could be something like day night. So for instance, like, so for instance, with trawling data, often the trawling is done continuously, okay? And, um, you know, but then you get a different subset of species at nighttime compared to daytime. Or say you were out, you know, you're doing field surveys, you know, and you were looking for birds, there'd be different birds from night and day, essentially. So you can use this covariate to, to actually say, well, those birds are in the same region. It's just that in these samples, they, they weren't present because they were sampled at night and they're, these, they're kind of, um, they're, they're daytime birds or daytime fish, okay? I'm not sure, yeah. All right, so that's kind of um, a way to deal with that effect. Okay, and then, um, yeah, and then we can then do, finally, we can do um, spatial prediction. Okay, hopefully this works. Okay, so we get this, these RCPs. Okay, and this is the congruent areas. So we've got lower and lower comp 95th confidence interval, upper 95th confidence, confidence interval and the um the mean okay and then essentially um based on like bathymetry we can probably can't remember back to that plot but essentially this is uh shallow kind of a shallow shelfy kind of island this is like an actually an island here okay and then this is kind of um medium depth sorry this is medium depth this one sp1 now sp3 is these deep very deep regions on the edge of the kind of the Kerguelen plateau okay so depth and temperature was obviously a very strong effect in this model because it's what kind of what we were using there's a bit of a latitudinal effect as you can see as well it's like kind of high probability over here over to here um but you could obviously incorporate a whole bunch of other i guess environmentally relevant covariates for your for your study okay so you could incorporate all sorts of things like yeah whatever you thought were important Okay, all right. And then um, I guess another interesting thing to point out with this compared to species archetype models is because this is a multinomial prediction. So it comes from a multinomial. We kind of believing that there's only like one um, RC, RC, sorry, one RCP type per site. Okay, and so these probabilities sum to one. Okay, so if you were to sum these, um, they would 
sum these maps across this, it would equal one. Okay. And so what you can what we can then do if we want to like hit a very so this might this map probably might be too complicated to communicate to a manager or for argument's sake of this area. Okay. Now we'd hope not. We'd hope they would understand this, but they might not. They might be like, oh, what's going on with these different colors and, and the, the different upper and lower competence rules? What does this mean? Okay. And so what we can do is so for instance, we really want to simplify it down, we could do some kind of hard classification. So we could say, um, we could say, well, give me for each site that I predicted to. Give me the um, the the RCP or the community with the highest probability of being of being present or being observed. Okay, all right, and then this is what I'll, this is what I'll finish on. It's our final map. Okay, and so then you get this kind of it's very coarse looking map, but you get this eco regional kind of prediction, this hard classification, which takes all this information on these probabilities of occurrences and all the species corrections and uh, the species profiles is embedded in it, but we can simplify it all the way down to this kind of this plot, which is, you know, you have this shallow ecoregion three, this mid depth ecoregion uh, one, and then this very the deeper region. I'm getting, maybe I'm getting my depths confused. Anyway, um, yeah, so we get this kind of three, three class ecoregion for this area, okay? All right, and that's kind of it. So the, the code um, is rendered in, a, in the Dropbox folder and there's some references in there too, if you're interested. Um, I guess if, you, if you're interested in playing with these models and you have any questions, um, I guess feel free to yeah, shoot me an email, hit me up on GitHub. Um, yeah, I'm always happy to help out. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Skip. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the polapp.com. I don't think there, there, there's one more question there, but I think it's related to Sam. Um, and I, I don't know if there's any, any question. People feel free to type in the chat as well. Um, the question in Paul app that, that remains to be answered is regarding Sam, like I mentioned is in problems where we already have only a few species, say S, is it possible to set K to S? So I guess what, what, what would happen if you set each archetype or if you set the number of archetypes to be the number of species? What are the consequences okay. in echo mix or is there perhaps a better approach in this situation? Yeah, so it, well, I mean, it probably, yeah, I mean, you could do that, I guess, but yeah, it kind of basically what would end up happening is you'd end up probably fitting, you'd probably end up getting lots of empty groups, I would say. So basically what happens is if you, if you, so if the species all had very different responses to the environment, okay, um, then you might, for argument's sake, if you had five species fit five groups, okay, and they all had a very different response to the environment, and then you might be able to get five RCPs out. But what I would imagine would happen is that there would probably be some like, you know, gradient that like half the species respond to, and another gradient that the other half of the species respond to, and so then you'd get like two RCP, two um two archetypes, and then you'd have like three archetypes, which essentially you're fitted, but essentially have like no posterior probability of a species belonging to it. Okay. All right. And so, yeah, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah. So you might have to, if you had five rare species and you want to fit them all and have information on them, um, like emerge out the other end, you might have to use something like, yeah, like a joint distribution model, which like maintains the species identity in the kind of prediction kind of output, I guess. Yep. So with that, um, I think that's it. Thank you very much for, for participating. And, and that was a really fantastic presentation. I think the, the code you made available uh, and the R markdown is going to be uh, very valuable for, for everybody. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Yudan. It was awesome.